Hello again, friends, and we hope you're having a pleasant day today. And welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's Drive Through, right here, wherever it is that you pull up each and every week to listen to your favorite podcast. I am your host, the great Brian Last, and I'm very pleased to present to you, right out of the cage, the man who will be answering your questions, Mr. Jim Cornette. Blow your fucking great nice day out your ass. How's that? What's the problem? Oh, for fuck's sake. You know, I try to relax. I try. I tell you, I, you know, I try. I just can't relax. No, you know, I, I, we talked on the experience last week. I won't go into a long rant here. Sure, I won't. Uh, but we talked on the experience last week when I got back from a long trip there to Chicago and back, cold weather, uh, you know, hard work, good work on the MLW TV program. Everybody seemed happy with everything. But I came home, you know, I got to unpack. I've got the, the writing project for Fighting Spirit. I've got the, the Cornette's collectibles orders. We've been swamped. We've got so many new listeners. The, the success is running rampant here in Cornette land, right? And Wednesday night. Cornette land? I, in Cornette land, yes. <clears throat> it's, well, they, they've shot Neverland to hell now, so I'm going to start Cornette <laughs> land. But in, in the world of Cornette, the world of Jim Cornette never sleeps. I've stole that from somebody somewhere. But anyway, uh, I finally, I got the, 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 the column out and the, the stuff unpacked and things to, and, and, and a dent in the, in the Cornette's collectibles orders. But I, why, Wednesday night, like 10 o'clock at night, I hit the fucking wall. I say, you know what? Cause I never do this. You know me. I never take a day off. I don't go on vacation my vacation is when I come home from being on the road and I'm back at home. That's my vacation. But I don't take time off. It's like Ole Anderson said one time when he was the booker. He said, all the fucking guys want days off. They want time off. Well, sure. They just wrestle. I can just say, I won't book you in Winston Salem and you got a day off, but I'm a booker. I think for a living, what am I going to do? Get up one day and say, I'm not going to fucking think, right? That's how Ole thought thinking. So I said, you know, I got to wring my brain out, as the big cat would say. You got to wring your brain is like a sponge. When it absorbs all the knowledge that it can, it must be wrung out. And and so I said, you know, I'm going to take two days. Nobody's going to eat me if this happens. There's nothing on fire. I'm not going to be, nobody's going to show up at the front door with rubber hoses and and pummel me into insensibility if just two days, 48 hours, I don't, I, I get good night's sleep. I eat good, wholesome, home-cooked food instead of crap on the road like I was. I, I sit in my hot tub and rest my weary bones. I wring my brain out. I watch some television. I play with my dog, Harley Quinn, because after all, happiness is a warm puppy. And a lot of puppy bubby, puppy bu- puppy bubby, puppy belly rubbing. Puppy bubby. Puppy belly <laughs> rubber baby buggy bumpers. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck we're is. So... Yeah, I do this for two days, for 48 hours. I don't get on the Twitter. I don't get on the email. I don't get on the telephone. I say I'm not, because you know me, once again, weekends, holidays, I always have a list of things to do every day. I get up in the morning. It's already, it's like a heaviness. When I wake up, I go, hi, heaviness. It's dwelling on me. What have I got to do today? How have I got to make the people happy today? What have I got to do to justify my existence? I'm always busy. I'm never caught up. I'm always behind I threw out the today to-do list each day. I just said, fuck it, and I relaxed. And then I'm going to get up, and today we're, we're recording. It's on the weekend, let's just say. <clears throat> we're, re- we're recording the show for Monday, and I figure I'll get back to work because now I'll be rested, refreshed, relaxed. I wake up this morning. I don't know if it's the fucking gout again. If there's a podiatrist out there. Oh, no. Suddenly, for no apparent purpose, the bottom of my foot, the heel, the pads of the bones under your foot, right? Everything that touches the ground is like somebody took a fucking hammer to it and it's all bruised, bone bruised, right? You can barely set it on the fucking ground. So some way or another, I've rested myself into a, another fucking malady that I did not have before. It's not the toe swelling up and the pain like the gout, but it's just the bottom of the foot. It just wakes up like that. Just wake up like that. And it's just, it have done nothing. I wasn't doing any jumping jacks. So I don't know what the fuck is going on. I've, I've obviously, I've injured myself by, you know, when you got a finely tuned race car or you got a, a, you know, a finely trained thoroughbred racehorse and all of a sudden it just is sits idle, doesn't do anything. 
I guess that's when things start falling apart. So I'm never taking any time off again. Huh. It could but be for all what, you. It could be from all that weight you were carrying on your shoulder when you carry that broadcast. Hey, no, now, no, 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 for just heaven's kidding, sake. Yeah, need you come in there with that. Eddie, can we get Eddie in here to get you out? Of- <laughs> but anyway, so, so I'm, I'm in pain, but I, I, if, if anybody's orders were delayed a couple of days, I apologize. If anybody, if, if people I've oh, emails to phone calls, uh, you know, it, but it was so refreshing. I was afraid people were going to do like one of those wellness checks when I wasn't on Twitter for two days, right? Like not, is he decomposing? In the fucking, you know, in the kitchen or something. I understand a big group of Cult of Cornet members got together. They were thinking about forming a class action lawsuit against you for disappearing on them like that. Well, I, I, you know what? Just coincidentally then, mind you, I know who they might be able to call. (laughs) If they want, no, they can't sue. They can't sue me through Stephen P. New because he's on our side. Conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. But. If you have any other type of legal issue besides being mad at Jim Cornette because he didn't get your orders out on time for 48 hours or didn't return your email or your phone call because he's too busy being irrelevant, if you've got any other legal issue, if you're, you or anyone in your family has been harmed in any way by big pharmaceutical companies, the big oil companies, the big companies in general, the Amazons of the world, the General Motors, you go to the guy that's gotten millions in judgments against big companies that fuck little people over the champion of the little guy protecting the babies born addicted to opioids, the people given cancer by dangerous chemicals, the victims of negligence, carelessness, greed, and fraud, Stephen P. New and the law offices of same new law office.com 888-692-8084. Hey, you know, Stephen's going to be a big part of the ASW event on April 13th when the Midnight Express goes in the All-Star Wrestling Hall of Fame there in Madison, West Virginia. But you do not need to wait until April 13th to contact him if he can help you out, if he can get you justice, if he can redeem your bad name that's been sullied through the mud. Whatever you need legally, Stephen P. knew by gum, he could have talked Nixon out of Watergate. You know, as a matter of fact, I may have to sue C2E2. <laughs> well, sue them for what? For goddamn selling out of all my, my uh, 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 have a beef with Jim Cornette tickets. No, they're almost gone, folks. <laughs> um, we mentioned it on the experience. I didn't know they'd last a day or two. I've not got the official call off, but also I haven't been really looking at the emails and it is the weekend, but there's definitely now less than 10 left. So tinyurl.com slash corny in Chicago. If you want to get one of the few remaining tickets to have a beef with me, and I'm right now, the thunderstorms are approaching. Can you hear that outside that maybe we, we should get the uh, knowledge and news underway before I lose all my electricity? Maybe an umbrella as well. Uh, I'm in the fucking house. I'm not going to get rained on, but it's a thunderstorm. It's electrical disturbance in the atmosphere. We could lose our fucking state of the ARP, state of the ARP, state of the art <laughs> Skype connection. Fucking hell. Apparently I've not been resting long enough, ladies and gentlemen, but you're on the top floor. Something could happen to the roof. Well, thanks a lot for giving me something <laughs> to fucking worry about. I got my fucking feet are aching. Goddamn electrical storms all around me. Now you're getting me worried that the fucking roof is going to cave in. Well, let's get some questions here on the show, Jim. I'm not sure I want to answer them now. Well, we have a few that have been sent in many times because they're hot button issues. So I'll ask one of them here to encapsulate all, right. all the many that have been sent in about this topic. Punch my hot button, baby. This was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from John Schwab. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is, is he Earl Schwab's brother? It could be. Or son. Hey, Jim. Earl I, Schwab used to paint the cars, didn't he? I don't know. No, that was Earl Scheib. Yeah, Earl Scheib painted a car for forty nine ninety nine. I'm not sure if Earl Schwab painted cars. What wasn't he? I had a Schwab once. The doctor had to take a Schwab to take a culture. Well, nevertheless. Oh boy! The wh- thunder rolls and the lightning yeah. strikes. <laughs> <laughs> thunder can't get here fast enough. Let's get to John Schwab's question. Hey Jim, I have heard you mention different merchandise items, but were you familiar with this video game that featured the Midnight Express? And of course, he sent a clip, and many other people did, Jim. This video game demo recently got released from 1989, and it has Stan and Bobby 
in the game. Did you know anything about this? I do. I did not know that, but I can give some background, as they say, in the legal business. Um, because it was very interesting. I noted that it, apparently the game was copyrighted UWC. Right. Or, and then later on, the actual game that came out had different characters and was WCW or whatever the fuck. The original name that Turner Broadcasting's wrestling company was going to have was the Universal Wrestling Corporation. They even went so far as the first contracts that were given out because they were, they all the people that were under contract to Crockett, those contracts would end as of October 31st, 1988, and as no, of November 1st, you would sign a new contract with the Universal Wrestling Corporation. And the first contracts actually said, I think the one I signed said U Universal Wrestling Corporation. <clears throat> and I'm not sure whether they ever changed it or not, but somewhere in that time, like the last month or so between the time that they were about to buy it and the time they had just bought it, and I think it was probably due to feedback from Jim Barnett, they instead of because Universal had been Universal Wrestling Federation, whatever, my God, there's Barnett speaking to me from above now. Well, that was uh, the thunder? That was the thunder. Wow. Um, I, I think that, that Barnett probably said, hey, Watts has just used Universal, whatever. What about? Because the program is already named World Championship Wrestling, and that was you know his company in Australia. Somewhere or another, they changed it right at the last, in the, in the first week or so. So that video game was probably the test when they were still – doing that the first thing they developed and at the same time the midnight express was never in the real game because that was probably <clears throat> shortly afterwards when we gave our notice and said we'll just fucking leave <laughs> rather than be booked by george scott and be a part of this fiasco and then uh, obviously they fired george scott and we came back to be a part of the fiasco without him so that's that was probably that and that was March and April and May of 89. So that probably fit in that category there where we were gone when they actually did the real one. Did you watch the demo video? No, I don't care. <laughs> you don't I care really, to see I mean, Bobby you know, and Stan in video game form? Well, no, it's it was a fucking unreleased video game that we never made a goddamn dime off of. So... But you're a completist. You don't care about a 1989 video game featuring the Midnight Express? No. Wow. Well, because I can't have it's not there's one copy of it, right? He didn't say you can't have it. Well, I'm not gonna fucking pay. I'm not gonna pay money <laughs> for it. But it's, then, how do you fucking play it? But still, I would think you would want to see it. If you heard that some video of a match that you didn't know was filmed at a house show popped up, you would be interested in seeing it, wouldn't you? Well, yes, because that was really us, not fake us in a goddamn video <laughs> game. And my feet hurt. I, I don't have time for this. All right. Well, let's get another question here, Jim. Oh this shit! There went there went the lightning, and it's pouring down fucking rain here. It was a dark and stormy night when Jim Cornette <laughs> entered the castle. This is a fair. Is this show actually going to air? <laughs> keep keep going. Let's see if <laughs> our next question. Either that, or I'm going to beat feet out of here. Our yeah. next question, Jim, was sent in via email to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Joe in Cincinnati, Ohio. Hello, Joe. What you know? Hello, Jim and Brian. How do you feel about Anthem Sports deleting Global Force Wrestling Master Tapes? Do you think they really did? <laughs> or are they just trying to screw Jeff Jarrett over for returning to WWE? Or do you think that this is just the latest chapter in the bad management of Impact slash Anthem? No protester in their right mind would delete master tapes. Well, that, no broadcaster. I think he means promoter here. Prom or promoter. Protester? It says protester. Sometimes they're the same thing. Uh, but yes, Folks, no you don't pay for this show. <laughs> just keep that in mind throughout the whole year. This is completely free to you. Um, I, I don't know anything about the particulars, but I will. Uh, yes, I will say that I have worked for a number of wrestling promotions and been involved with a number of television productions at a fairly high level. And it, it, no, this uh, the only way this could have happened was by complete 
incompetence and goofy mistake or I don't even know that they would do something like that to be vindictive because that that no I, it, it but it's not just they said it was in the normal course of business freeing up space on our so no that's when you've got six cameras ISOed on a fucking shoot and the finished product and show has already been put together and post-produced and aired and is in the library then you can wipe all that shit if you know if it's and especially if you don't want to save it for packages or whatever but no there's no reason that anybody would delete finished master programming uh it, it, in their systems just for in the normal course of business to save space that's ridiculous and that it, it, no there's something else going on but i'm not saying that somebody couldn't have just been a fucking idiot like oops you know I'm not saying it was malicious, but you don't do that. That doesn't happen. That's a big I, fuck up if that's what happens. Yeah, that's that, a big, actually, big fuck up. But hey, it's it's wrestling, and considering many people, and I remember when, uh, 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 oh, what was his name? The Tommy Edwards was the director of the WCW Saturday Night Show on TBS, and he got fired because he allowed them somehow, or at least he took the blame that they played the wrong show one Saturday night. They played the show from the previous week. I mean, you, that happens on WHSV Channel 3, Harrisonburg, Virginia, every once in a while. You stick the wrong tape in because Master Control is a fucking guy reading a newspaper. But but no, on TBS, oh, we stuck the wrong tape in. You know, no. So that shit happens, but that it doesn't make sense under the the reasoning that they gave. Our next question, Jim, was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from under authority. You told us about Dusty's response to your mention of the space shuttle in the Ron Garvin promo. <laughs> Did you get in trouble for saying all Misty Blue could think about was Dick? Dick Murdoch, that is. No. Funniest thing ever. Be because, because I set it up properly. Because I was referring throughout the entire promo, I was referring to Dick Murdoch by uh, who was standing there by his given Christian name of Dick Murdoch. And as, and it was coming up on the mix match where it was dusty and Barry Windham and by the Nikita, maybe and, and Misty blue against me in the midnight express and, and Dick Murdoch. And I said, uh, I said, obviously I said, this whole thing has come about because look at Dick Murdoch. Dick Murdoch is a, 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 a sexy man, a handsome man, a debonair man, a great athlete. Misty Blue is obviously in love with Dick Murdoch. Misty Blue is enamored of Dick Murdoch. Misty Blue is fixated on Dick Murdoch. As a matter of fact, I have it on good authority that all that Misty Blue can think about is Dick. <laughs> what can they say? <laughs> so there you have it. All right. No trouble. And as a matter of fact, the one time that... <laughs> David Crockett was not happy because I wormed what, you know, in, in, I think it was 1987 or 88 stands part of the team. Now sweet Stan, the gangster of love. Right. I said, you know, uh, Madonna and Sean Penn just got a divorce. Sweet Stan could be Madonna's next Sean. Joan Collins and Peter Holm got a divorce. Sweet Stan could be Joan Collins' next Peter. <laughs> and David Crockett came up. What do you, I said, no, listen back to what I said. And you tell me that there's any uh, Christian names, given Christian names, David Crockett. It's all in a setup. Our next question, Jim, was sent in on Twitter using a hashtag corny drive through from Tony Barker. Hi, Jim. I am watching Mid-South from the summer of 1984, and Sonny King is feuding with Butch Reed. Oh, God damn. My question to you is, what did you think of Sonny King from this era? He seemed a little out of place in the middle of Mid-South's youth movement. And worker movement. And, uh, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> no, I, I, I don't want to say anything bad. Sonny was a nice guy to me. Sonny was a, a, a kind of a loner. He was he was very intelligent, read a lot. He was somewhat, uh, as they said, militant in in the seventies in his day. But he was a nice man, and he was a tough son of a gun. He was a badass in real life. Now don't fuck with Sonny King. And of course, he's the one that was that in Charlotte. He was just visiting the wrestling show that night, some of his friends when he was over in Charlotte while he, I think he was in this territory or maybe so. Anyway, these guys trying to bust in the back door to get into the matches. This old door guard was trying to have, have trouble. They were drunk, trying to keep them back. And here Sonny came to the rescue 
And those guys weren't going to come in that fucking door and fuck with that guard. And one of them fucking stabbed him, pulled a fucking knife out and fucking cut him bad and actually nicked his heart with the knife. And he had to have open heart surgery where the fucking surgeon actually had to give him the heart massage, held his heart in his hand the whole nine yards. And he came back from that. And, and this was before the run in Mid-South. This was Jerry Jarrett's the only one that ever did an angle on it because he really liked Sonny King as a person and he always used him. That's the so, best promo I ever saw Sonny King do. Yeah, he came back and on TV said, you know, I give the when the surgeon and he had that way of speaking, you know, when he held my heart in his hand, you know, and um, <laughs> I can't do Sonny, but anyway, that was an effective deal. But his by that point, his work was just not. It, it physically and and it just he had a different style and it was hard it was kind of hard to work with him on a, in a single match i managed hercules hernandez against him and and it was just it you know it, they weren't good they weren't good matches and hercules could go boy but you know but he, they were trying to find another african american baby face to replace dog sonny was part of that too along with george wells master g and along with brickhouse brown and along with you know, whoever else, but they switch butch baby face and everything. And it just, it was too soon. You can't, you can't do that with anybody. So, but it, yeah, some of those matches were not pretty. How do you think Iceman Parsons would have done if they brought him in right after the dog left? Um, it, it, it not, no, because Iceman was really over in Dallas, but Iceman was really over in Dallas on, in the second tier. He wasn't a Von Erich and he wasn't a guy working with the Von Erichs. He was the second tier level that Chris Adams was as a baby face until they switched Chris Hill and put him against Von Erichs. They needed somebody that, well, they, they didn't really need anybody at all at that point. You weren't going to replace dog, but it needed to be somebody that the people hadn't seen that you could portray as a main event fucking guy. But every time they did that was somebody that in another situation could have been, they just compared them to dog. Cause you can't just, it was like trying to replace, okay, Hillary Clinton didn't win. Let's get another woman. No, right. It's, yeah, yeah. It's not the same thing. Were you ever around the snowman? Oh, good Lord. Um, <laughs> I'm, no, I met him once or twice. And I think they tried that too at one point. And the only, the only mileage that ever, anybody ever really got out of snowman was doing a shoot angle over the shoot angle that he did in Memphis, you know, which is, uh, I can't even remember all the details. We'd have to have Randy Hales on to explain that. But you know, when he really had stolen the belt and it was in the papers and he was sideways with Lawler and then they tried to make a shoot out of it. And that's, they got mileage out of snowman that way. Otherwise he looked great, but it, you know, eh. after a few years had gone by and if they hadn't tried every other black wrestler in the history of the world uh you know a guy like that mike could have but watts could have probably got him over but by then the territory was fucking on its ass he put him so. in a superdome with muhammad ali well there you go but let's get another question here on the show jim this next one was sent in on twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from hd sunstrom do you have any good stories about king kong bundy i just read about his <laughs> passing what was he like as a person and a performer? Um, and obviously we're, we're sorry he passed away. And, and I don't even know exactly what the cause was. I would have to think that for someone who was significantly over 400 pounds for a, a lot of his adult life, that that probably would have played a part in it. But um, I love Bundy. Bundy was fucking hilarious. And of course, I've, you know, I've told the stories once again, the Ernie Ladd story is Bundy. You big fat piece of shit. You know, we bring you in here. We bring guys in to get you over. What do you do? You dumb yourself out of position. You know, he had come into mid South when he was like legitimately a rookie, like a year, year and a half in the business. And they put him on top and gave him the five count pin thing. And, but one time they said that fucking some guy in Shreveport, some fan got so hot, whatever Bundy had done as Bundy's leaving the ring, he jumped on Bundy from behind and jumped up on his head. And Bundy, it was like trying to get a cat off your fucking head. He was twice the size of this guy, but he couldn't get him fucking off. And Grizzly Smith retired. <clears throat> you know, his old seven foot fucking 350 pound ass jumps off the stage in the Memorial Auditorium in Shreveport to go rescue King Kong Bundy from this fucking 150 pound mark. So he got <laughs> blistered on that, you know, just endlessly. But no, he was a great talent to be able to move around like that and to look like that. You know, he looked like the kingpin from Spider-Man or, you know, whatever. Um, 
great gimmick, good performer. When you know he was on top when he left the business because he got into acting and all that other shit. And by the time he came back for that second run in the '90s, I think you know the the in ring had moved along to where you couldn't just be the the big monster, and he wasn't. He was all he was older by that point, but also he wasn't as special to be able to move, you know, at that size as he once was. When you've got a world with Vaders and all that other shit in it, yeah. uh, I didn't mean to say other shit, but you know what I mean. Yeah, Bigelow. Um, <clears throat> Bigelow, yeah. So it just some of the uniqueness was off, but he was a great guy and funny and had that booming voice. Um, so I always enjoyed being around him. Never had any issues, but yeah, he he took some abuse at some points in his early in his career there. And that was, I mean, even when he was out of the territory, people were still doing Ernie going, Bundy, you have big fat piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, and some of those things would stick, you know. Were you ever around Buck Robley at all? Good God. Um, not in Mid-South, but when he had found the year that I left WCW, oh, I'm sitting right. home in Charlotte, right? That's right. Yeah. And I think I said this, but for the new listeners, cause there's so many of them, um, I'm setting up Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and I'm not working anything regularly in 1991. I'm in Charlotte, and all of a sudden, I get a call on my answer machine from Buck Robley. Or, to be more precise, Colonel Buckley Christopher George Robley III. Don't call me <laughs> yellow. Yellow Belly Buck Robley. Phil Robley to his friends. He had a lot of names. Yeah. Um, And he had found a fucking guy a backer an angel as he said that's what they used to call it back in the carny days he'd found an angel in new orleans to back him in a promotion and to get on tv and this guy he looked like elvis presley but he had met robley had met him at the racetrack and he had kind of an elvis gimmick but he actually also i think owned car lots and he the idea was they were going to present this guy as the baby face backer of the whole thing that was bringing back pro wrestling to the folks in Chalmette and New Orleans and Metairie and all the, you know, the old mid South uh, area down there. And they were going to make him a big baby face so that he continued to spend the money. And did I mention he met the guy at the racetrack and I went <laughs> down there and did one, one or two TV tapings. I can't remember, but he flew me over to new Orleans, did the TV tapings, managed Ron powers, did some commentary or whatever. And somebody actually sent me a link to some of the show's uh, results. So I could refresh myself on it back when we were talking about it before, but basically he was on several months on a local broadcast station in new Orleans. And then th they had come up with an idea where the guy with the backer was going to be a big baby face because he was going to, go to the children's hospitals and fucking give out tickets to all the little kids and that make him a big baby face. But I don't think that worked. And they were off TV after a while. And, but on the formats, Buck called me Ellen Cornette because late night Cornette, because since I was still on Crockett hours, like when I had been working, I was sleeping until one in the afternoon and I'd be up till four or five in the morning. <clears throat> but Buck would be up a lot you know, a lot more of those hours than I was. I was, I was still sleeping the same amount of hours. I was just, it was a slightly different schedule, but I think Buck at that time period was not sleeping a lot either. <laughs> so I don't, you know, but that's, yeah, I worked for him once or twice and it did. Is, see, that's a, he was one of those guys. He had a good head for the psychology of the business and he could talk reasonably well and had that voice anyway, but and and it was broken in back in the days when you didn't have to look like anything physically. But he got over in mid south on psychology, on promos and fucking psychology of the thing. But he always looked like shit to me. His work was good, but if it was if it was being done by a guy that looked like an athlete, it would have been better. I agree. And, but he but I completely and, and, agree. And because he'd been in kind of in the Tulsa scene and he knew what worked down in Louisiana and he was, he worked with Watts a lot. But when you think about it for 15 years, he never really, and Kansas city when they needed a booker, you know, cause he, cause he was close with Brody. So you knew if you made Buck Robley, your booker, Brody would work shots for you. So then, so in San Antonio, he did. So that was the way he was Atlanta. able to stay in the Atlanta once, famously once they let him book, <laughs> <laughs> but most time he was down in the Louisiana, Texas territory because that's, he knew that those fans and that style and, and he could get you Brody, but he was not a widely traveled 
top guy. That's why when everybody says they see results of the Superdome and the main event, Buck Robley's in the main event, everybody else in the rest of the country went, what the fuck? But that's, you know, it was. That was that. Our next question, Jim, was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from Jeffrey Rose. I was watching Halloween Havoc 1989, where you managed the Dynamic Dudes versus the Fabulous Freebirds for the World Tag Team titles. I was wondering, where the hell was Michael Hayes' belt? <laughs> you know, I saw that question on, on, on Twitter. Um, I don't know. To, I, 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 I don't even remember an issue where he had forgotten his belt or whatever, like that we knew he might've just snuck out there and not told anybody and just not worn the belt. And we never noticed. I don't know, but apparently he had forgotten to bring it if he didn't have it, but I have no insight on the, you know, the, the reasoning for why he came out not wearing a belt. I can't, it, it maybe had they left it at home. Had somebody taken off with one at that point? I, I do not know. Who is the big proponent of pushing that version of the Freebirds to be the world tag team champions? That version of the free birds. <laughs> no, but they weren't on the booking committee by that point. Uh, but well, here's the thing. Right about the time where everything went to hell with George Scott, they had, the the machinery had already been set in motion, I think, because Michael was really wanting that. But all when they went to a committee after George Scott of Jim Ross and, and uh, you know, Barnett was advising by that point. Jim heard Jim Ross. It, it, JR remembered they were great in Louisiana. Barnett obviously remembered the Freebirds were great. So they went with that, and it just it didn't work because it wasn't, you know, Jimmy Garvin was not a Freebird in people's minds, and it was years later. It wasn't 1979 anymore. It was 1989. And they'd already seen the Freebirds kicking around for the past couple of years in various incarnations where Buddy and Michael came in in 87 for a while after the UWF merger. And Terry had been mostly in Japan and was still going back and forth to Japan. So sometimes it was just Michael and Jimmy. It just it, it didn't work. It wasn't the right time. But they tried. They tried to work like the Road Warriors to get some fucking old fashioned heat. But all they succeeded in doing was pissing off all their babyface opponents. Because all of a sudden Jimmy Garvin was trying to work like fucking animal, and he'd been a chicken shit heel and a very good one that drew money for the previous fucking ten fucking years. And suddenly he's a goddamn kick ass tough guy wearing. You know they bought the Freebirds. Michael had even gone to Michael had become the, you know, gone through the Elvis in Vegas phase where he was all <laughs> bright and sparkly in eighties and moonwalking and shit. The free birds were these ass kicking rednecks. that looked like fucking a combination of Leonard Skinner and fucking black Oak, Arkansas from the, you know, streets of Atlanta and would kick your fucking ass and wore cowboy boots. And at that time, buddy Roberts gets in the fucking ring and reunion arena sold out one of the Star Wars shows. He pulls his cowboy boot off to beat the Von Erichs over the head with it. An ounce of fucking weed falls out of it <laughs> in front of 20,000 people. But that, that, they expected that. That was the free birds. Jack Daniels, whiskey drinking, that fucking Terry Gordy, that fucking beast. Piss him off sometime, motherfucker. That was the free birds. It wasn't fucking spandex, Michael Jackson gloved, fucking michael hayes and jimmy garvin and <laughs> and then they get fucking rocky king as little richard marley and they're just <laughs> off the goddamn they've lost the plot as they say it how, how much longer can i riff on the replacement free birds it didn't work i was a kid and i loved everything about wrestling and even i couldn't figure out why they were the tag team champion these guys are just dancing with each other in the ring <laughs> they both i mean even though you find out michael hayes it was always a re big revelation when you found out michael hayes's age because he looks so much older than he was. I was like, who are these two old yeah. guys <laughs> dancing with each other? But uh, let's get another question here, Jim. This one was sent in to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Christopher Albright. After hearing about Howard Finkel's health, I was wondering if Jim had any good stories about Howard. I hope Howard recovers soon, and thank you for responding to my question. Oh, God, I love Finkel. I mean, you know... It <laughs> Howard was so nice and so pleasant, so upbeat all the time. I want to say was like he's passed away. I'm saying when I worked with him, Howard was always so upbeat and so pleasant and chipper and he could find the best in anything. And he was, he, he was the first one into the office every morning. He did the Finkel report. Does everybody know what the Finkel report was these days? I don't think so. 
what it was was back when there were still 800 numbers or 900 numbers or whatever the fuck the wrestling hotlines and also the wrestling uh, you know observer and also the other newsletters that existed back in the the early and mid 90s and anything else if if any wrestling was in mainstream publications or news or anything was going on Howard would come into the office six o'clock in the morning before anybody got there. And he would listen to those and he would transcribe anything that the that Vince, his assistants and lieutenants and the creative team and agents needed to know in the, and he would coalesce all this into the Finkel report news of anything that he thought that we would be interested in. And it was, I still have a bunch of them and it was, it was great. It was actually the in-house version of the wrestling observer. Um, and but he was always ready to help. He was always going the extra mile. He was a great ring announcer, always doing stuff. But they fucked with him mercilessly. One time, uh, they had mentioned that he had parked his brand new car that he got out at one of the early Monday Night Raw tapings. When I guess Kurt Henning and somebody fought out on the fucking streets and they were bouncing each other off a car. It was fucking Sean Howard's. Michaels. There you go. It was Howard's car, and he was seeing that for the first time. That's why when they broke mine in Atlantic City. When I got fucking hot and fucking uh, went home and and didn't go to the office for a couple of days till finally Jr. called and I would speak to him. I said, "Hey, I said I w- I've not only done angles with that car, I would have fucking caved the back windshield in myself if you'd asked me. But don't treat me treat me like I'm fucking Finkel and fuck with my shit, right? Because they would fuck with him and they always wanted to pull his pants down in the tuxedo match with him and Whippleman." You know, downtown Bruno. You know, they were always just fucking with Howard, but I always liked Howard. I liked riding with him. He was he did music trivia. He was great to talk to. And once again, just always a pleasant human being. So, but they, a lot of times, you know, because Vince has that fucking sense of humor, they just wanted to fuck with people. I thought it was, it was more hard hearted or mean spirited than just, you know, fucking with your friends. But what? But they did pay for his car. They paid for mine too. So, and they forced him off TV because they thought he was too old, which was ridiculous. He was the best ring announcer they had ever had. Well, and that's you know more Kevin Dunn bullshit. So he can you know probably hire some more women that he can fucking moon over in his mind because he's got that Arrested Development type of thing. Well, let's get another question in here about Arrested Development. This next one, Jim, was sent in on Twitter using a hashtag corny drive through from. Your friend and mine, the noted wrestling journalist, David Bixenspan. Corny, you cut a promo in the studio. Direct- that, that's, that's Mr. Corny to you now, Bix, you know, for heaven's sake. No, noted, noted journalist and gadabout. You know, that's a term you don't hear a lot in, in these days, gadabout. He's the town gadabout. He's into a little bit of everything. Well, you'll, you'll see him on a course of a day. You'll see him. You'll talk to him. He's a gadabout. Bix is a gadabout. Well, let's see what he is going to get about here with this question. Corny, (laughs) you cut a promo in the studio directly before Vincent Young made his debut, where the crowd completely turned on him over his awful breakdancing and started cheering Trent Knight wildly. What do you remember about this fiasco? That was more George Scottness. Um... Vincent Young, the breakdancing baby face that looked like fucking a, uh, he was wearing Apollo Creed's cast offs from Rocky three was Mark Scarpa, who was Chief J. Strongbow, J. Scar- Joe Scarpa's son that and since J. Strongbow and George Scott were friends, George Scott thought that Vincent Young the son of his friend would be the next big baby face. You see where this is going and oh, and he can break dance. All the kids are doing it. George Scott had a breakdown. I think he had a middle breakdown. I've always thought he was suffering from Alzheimer's and that was in 1989. He had no idea what break dancing was or that, you know what, if you're going to do it at that point, don't have this fucking white boy doing it. Um, and the people just fucking were offended. It hurt their fucking feelings. <laughs> And they did everything they could. Trent Knight couldn't have won a popularity contest if the only people that voted were his immediate family. He had never won a match, ever. He was a good kid and a good job guy, but he was never featured in any way. But they just said, fuck this moron. And, but, but they, he had heat by the time the bell rang, just from popping into the ring and fucking doing his goddamn herky-jerky bullshit. And he looked like a putz. And he was a stooge. 
<laughs> along with that fucking, who knows what the fuck that Byron Scott, the son of George Scott that he was into, he was the shadiest looking fucking character. They made him a referee so that he could go infiltrate the locker room and stooge for his dad on what everybody was saying about his fucking lousy booking. Cause he was transparent. You could see right through him like a fucking cellophane sheet. Uh, he would walk by you and you were having a private conversation. He would actually lean like to the direction of you with his ear as he walked by trying to be nonchalant so he could pick up on your Bobby Eaton called him a stooge. Bobby Eaton didn't like him. He's the only motherfucker I've ever known that Bobby Eaton instantly didn't like. Well, except for his father, George Scott, <laughs> who never fucking to this day has spoken a word to Bobby Eaton. And we had a meeting with him. He didn't even address Bobby. So the whole family and everybody they picked was a shit. Did I mention this? Fuck George Scott and and fucking <laughs> Chief J Strongbow's goddamn break dancing fucking flag wearing piece of shit son <laughs> and the goddamn stooge referee Byron Scott looked like he was fucking mainline and heroin when he looked in his fucking eyes. It was a whole goddamn fiasco was the shits for about 3 months around there. More I think about it now. Well, let's continue with this fiasco here today, Thanks, Jim. Fix. Thanks, Vix. Thanks, <laughs> Vix. This next question, Jim, was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from the man of the 90s. Is it me? Yes. <laughs> or do John Fell and Rodney Estes always seem to be at the front of the line with their questions? Well, no, it's just because they submit more questions because they're inquisitive people and inquiring minds like to know and they like to assimilate knowledge so that they can form cogent similes and opinions on the various and sundry items of wrestling uh, knowledge and psychology and history that we quote here. And also they're big kiss asses. Our next question Jim, was <laughs> sent in via email, the corny. We, we, lo we, we love you, John and Rodney. It's actually, it's not Rodney Estes. It's Rod. It's at, which rhymes with testes, which, <laughs> which stands for balls. And we know Rodney has none of those. No, ladies and gentlemen, it's Rodney Esty. It's not plural. He's only got one ball. I read it as Rod it was written. Rod they used to, in the sixth grade, they used to call him Rodney Esty with one testy. That's what they used to call him back in, in grade school. All right. Our next question, Jim, was sent in <laughs> to corny drive through at gmail.com from John Wagner in Los Angeles, California. He has two questions here. During the Steve Walker and Mike Kramer match against the Natural Disasters on the November 21st, 1992 episode of WWF Superstars, Bobby Heenan asked Vince McMahon, what if your brother stabbed you in the back? Vince angrily replied, I don't have a brother. Bobby then quipped, you don't deserve one. It is known Vince does in fact have a brother, Rod <laughs> McMahon. Why hasn't Rod ever been mentioned on WWE TV? Is Vince ashamed of Rod? Do you have any interesting Rod McMahon stories? Well, I, I, I wish you'd have asked for Ed McMahon stories because I had some really interesting ones about it. this one time he brought me this check to my own home. Um, no, first of all, I, you, what's this young man's name that asked this question? John Wagner in Los Angeles, California. Well, John, when you start out with the, uh, during the Steve Walker and Vincent Young match against the, not like, like we have memorized these things. And I truthfully think that you need a hobby, uh, that, that you're, you're way too deep in this catalog at this point, but no, I, I, I do not know that he does have a brother, old Roderick McMahon. That's right. And I've never met that brother, nor I do. I don't know that that brother ever comes around. Possibly there, that brother has signed a non-disclosure agreement. I have no, <laughs> I don't really know why that, that Vince's brother has never, but it seems like at some point, if he was interested in it, they would have brought him out and fucking tombstoned him or given him a stunner or something. So I have to think that, Possibly Rod might consider uh, that that branch of the family the black sheeps. I have no idea. Is there is there information on the uh, internet about old Roderick McMahon? I didn't do any uh, deep research on this one, but I do think uh, I think there were rumors a couple of years back when they did the Vince McMahon got blown up and killed on Raw when they were going to have the funeral before they had to scrap the whole thing. the The rumor was that the real Rod McMahon was going to be there, which would have been very interesting, but. I don't know where rumors get started. And that would have made everybody believe it then. If the, the unknown brother who's never been seen showed up <laughs> yeah. and 
Yeah, yeah. You know, and they said, there's his brother, so he's really dead. That would have sold it. And Vince Sr. had a brother named Rod, right, who was also a promoter. Well, I do not know about that because I know that Vince Sr.'s father, Jess, worked with Tex Rick Rickard in boxing promotion in the Garden in the, tw in the 20s and 30s. Yeah, I think he had a brother, also named Pos Rod. And I believe he was a promoter as well. I, now I have to go back and double check it. Well, then there you go. Well, then it makes sense that these McMahons are are, are so enamored of their, of their family names that they just pass the same names down to the to the succeeding generations. And then, well, I guess I guess Vince and Rod both broke the string because I don't. Vince doesn't have any sons named Vince, and I don't guess Rod has any sons named Rod. Maybe it was maybe Hot Rod. <laughs> Maybe Hot Rod was was one Rodney of the Well, no, Roddy Piper. Oh, well, well, maybe, maybe no, because I know all the McMahons have both their testes. Uh, John Wagner from Los Angeles, California. You're not paying this. Question. You're not paying for this program, folks. We want to remind you again. Keep that in the forefront of your mind. And my feet hurt, so keep that in your mind also. Here's John's second question. He gets another one. During the Steve Walker and Mike Kramer match against oh the Natural Disasters on the, on the November 21st, 1992 episode of WWF Superstars, Bobby Heenan said, he is going to come crawling back to me. Vince asked, who is he? We've all heard of Vince's anger towards pronouns from the artful Dodger. Do you have any personal stories of Vince correcting someone for the use of pronouns? And or have you seen Vince get irrationally upset for someone's use of words or word choice, excuse me. Well, obviously, yes. Anytime somebody calls a belt a belt or, you know, he hates switch the belt, drop the strap. He hates hospital. It's me medical facility. Don't say wrestler, et cetera. So we've seen that many times. And yes, and pronouns, pal, is a big thing. But now I'm assuming that John Wagner of Pocatello, Idaho, or wherever the fuck, it, basically he has only seen one episode of television wrestling in his life. And it was the March 13, 1979 <laughs> edition of that. And he has based all the questions he has on professional wrestling off this one television broadcast. I think now before you write in again, John, you need to watch uh, at least one more episode of television. Our next question, Jim was sent in via email to Cordy drive through at gmail.com from David Fulton. I recently watched an interview with you where you listed all of the fortunate wrestling-related events you were privy to. One of these was sitting at a table with Buddy Rogers and Ric Flair, the two nature boys. Would you please catch the cult of Cornette up with that moment? What went down? What was said? How did these two variant nature boys get along? Well, no, I didn't say I was sitting at a table, although we did sit uh, at, the, you know, it was part of John Arezzi's Weekend of Champions. Uh, so we did set at a, a dais up on the podium and they had the, the dinner thing and we had the Q and A's and stuff, but no, the biggest kick I got was seeing them afterwards. It was late at night. It was a dark and stormy night. It was late at night <laughs> and in the hotel, the Ramada or whatever, where John had this thing. And I go down to get change for the Coke machine from the front desk back when you still did such a thing. And I said, there is nature boy, Ric Flair and nature boy, Buddy Rogers, having cocktails because the bar was still open. They each had a drink in their hand, but they're standing there next to the pay phone. They're both not prank calling, but drunk calling old friends of theirs to say hello. They both had the same habits. And, and once again, this is not a guy that Flair had known well personally uh, throughout his entire life. George Scott said, hey, we're going to give you this gimmick. Be like fucking buddy rogers because you're the you're the whole package right you can update the buddy rogers thing but it turns out that they were somewhat similar in personality they both <laughs> love to fucking call people up on the goddamn phone and be up late at night and etc cetera, etc cetera. and that that was that was a cool moment there that was a history making moment even better than when when georgie Ann got buddy to take a picture and bruno to take a picture with buddy after all those years that it was was even a a bigger moment than that what do you remember about Sherry Martell sneaking into the event in disguise? Oh God, that was hilarious too. Um, cause she was still working for Vince, but she wanted to see all of us. Uh, she, she knew everybody obviously. And you know, so she snuck in dressed as, as not like a, a character of some kind, but just dressed in old floppy clothes and everything just so she could come in and say hello and hang out with the boys. She was one of the boys. And that's, that's a compliment. 
at least it used to be. I don't know if it, if it is now, but when you told one of the girls that she was one of the boys, that was a compliment. How much credit do you think John Arezzi deserves for creating what is now in a whole industry with these conventions all over the country? Oh, God. I mean, you know, everybody else said they've worked hard on theirs that they established, but this was just way before its time and ahead of its day and and wasn't really done back in those days except for the WFIA conventions where they'd go to a territory and they'd bring all the, you know, the guys that were in that territory. But this was stars from around the world, some of the older and newer biggest you know, names that people never got a chance to meet in person. So, John, it definitely was the, you know, the precursor of everything that's been done since then. People have put their own spin on it. But, I mean, just for how can you beat having Luthez, Buddy Rogers, Ric Flair, and fucking Bruno Sammartino in the same goddamn place? I mean, he just he he shot the moon on the first try. Our next question, Jim, was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Brandon Folson. Cumberland Gap, Tennessee. The Midnight Express is my all-time favorite tag team, and Beautiful Bobby is in my top five all-time favorite pro wrestlers. There is one bump of his, though, that never made much sense to me. (laughs) He'd shoot a guy into the turnbuckle, charge at them, they'd move, and he'd straddle and sit on the second rope. What was he going for? A monkey flip? A Bronco Buster? Because had he ever hit it, he would have been straddling the guy's midsection. <laughs> and that would have sure looked awkward. Can you explain that bump? P.S. I slid out of the road on my way to work this morning and landed on my side in a ditch. I had to drive through playing loud and had to turn down you talking so the people who stopped to help could hear me say I was okay. I can't explain my ditch bump, but hopefully you can explain Bobby's. Well, and and thankfully you're okay there, and we got you out of the ditch. Um, and actually, your first guess was correct. It's supposed to be the monkey flip. But here's the thing. And now that you mention that, and see, that's a, when you're you can't see the forest for the trees. That's something I should have come up with and had him hit it earlier in the match a time or two. But the way I originally remember him doing it was that we had there used to be a spot that we would do at the Fantastics back in Dallas where it was a, a babyface tag team spot where they would shoot member of the Midnight Express into the turnbuckles in their corner. And then Bobby would run up and jump up and do the monkey flip thing. But when he was up, his feet were on Bobby's thighs or the heels thighs and his, he would stand straight up and he would high five tag his partner monkey flip the heel out. And the partner would jump in over the top rope and hit a drop kick when the heel came up or whatever. And they would do tags like that. So then later on, during the fucking um, uh, heat, Bobby would shoot the baby face in and go for a fucking monkey flip, but the baby face would move and he would fucking straddle the, the turnbuckles and the baby face would be able to get the hot tag, et cetera. And then it just it got such a pop, like everything else, even the great ones do it. He just started doing that fucking move. And there was no context to it after that with the monkey flip thing. And but that's that's what that was. It was allegedly he was going for a monkey flip, but the guy would move and his feet would go all the way through the turnbuckles, and he'd more or less face buster himself on the thing and boom up, and that gives the baby face a chance to get away. That's not even as bad as Arn. What was Arn doing when he would jump down and like the guy's legs would catch him in the balls? Um, was he going for a hug? What, what was he going for when he did? The- no, no, no. That was um um. If I'm thinking about it right, is that the one where the guy would be on his hands and knees and Arn would be like putting weight on his back, crunching him, and then he'd jump up and the guy would spin around and his knees would be facing up and Arn would land on his nut on his nuts on the knees? Or was that Rick Rude? Or it could have been both. But there was also the thing where you would you would uh, uh, go for the goddamn leaping fucking Zabada and they'd spin and catch you. Well, you know what I'm saying. We've had more testicle oh, talk on this episode than any other yeah. episode <laughs> so far. Uh, it, it, because, because of, because, and, and see Rodney sometimes also he, he gets grumpy or as we used to say, he gets testy. So there's testy Rod Esty who only has one testy. Uh, let's get another question in here, Jim. This one was sent in the, uh, on Twitter using a hashtag corny drive through from Justin Robar. And this is a question that various people have sent in, so they certainly want to hear your take. 
How do you feel about the vocal minority who claim that Roman Reigns' leukemia is a work? We've seen a lot in wrestling. Would that be an all-time low if true? I don't believe it for the record. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it would be. And think how much territory that takes in all time low in wrestling if it was true. But no, it's not. Obviously, there's people who think the earth is flat and Montreal was a work and fucking Trump is sane and all that other stuff. But no, it's it's ridiculous that they would not have especially as a publicly traded company now. I mean, it's not like they can try to get any heat in a good way or any kind of way. Uh, they would have never have allowed that to be said if, if that was not true. No. So yes, you're right there, fellow. Our next question, Jim was sent in to Courtney drive through at gmail.com from Brian Doherty. I have a, what if question for you, Jim, if for whatever reason, the Memphis promotion never made it to the nineties and Louisville went dark. Would you have considered promoting Smoky Mountain wrestling cards in the Louisville area? or even basing your new promotion in Louisville? Um, well, yeah, I would have definitely uh, considered running cards in the area if there was no wrestling going on in Louisville. Yes, because it's only four hours from Knoxville, but it still, just because I would have considered it, didn't mean that we could actually do it because we'd have had to got television. And at that point in time, if, if Jerry Jarrett did not have a television program on in Louisville, I failed to see how we could have got one on because it would have been basically impossible. Uh, you know, Jarrett still TV went from channel three, the NBC affiliate to 41, the Fox affiliate during that period of time. But that was still broadcast television and still a strong station, just not as strong as channel three had been. Um, so if Jarrett had not been in the market, it would have been purely because he couldn't get television. If he couldn't have got television, with all those years and the deal with the gardens and all that other stuff, then we probably wouldn't have been able to get it either. So it would have been mental masturbation, as they say. Jim, several look, people look, have said... Wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> I think I need water wings. Can you hear the rain now? Uh, Heaven's on the roof. Listen to the rhythm of the falling rain. All right, nevertheless. Faintly, faintly. Yeah, yeah, faintly. Right. Well, it's coming down out there. You know, it's, it's raining cats and dogs. I know because on the way in, I stepped in a poodle. Well, let's get another question here, Jim. And bingo. This one was sent in by several people. So I'll just ask you a version of all their questions. And I'll be glad to take a shot at it. <laughs> Jim, what are your thoughts on the recent Ronda Rousey social media words and videos? That's my idea. Um... <laughs> No, I love the idea they're trying to make it a shoot, but why do you have to say the words script and fake? You can shoot and make it pointed and 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 you can infer things. You don't have to come out and say that shit. And I know that they're I'm not saying Ronda everybody's saying Ronda Rousey is doing it. I'm sure they're obviously not only directing her to do it, but potentially, you know, doing it for her and, you know, because they want people to be mad at her. And so they're basically, they're making the wrestling fans mad by making her the outsider that doesn't respect her business. When in, in, in actuality, the WWE staff and administration are the outsiders that don't respect the wrestling business. But that's, so that's kind of fucking ironic there, but you, you just, you don't have to do that because then it's, it's the same Logic as uh, the problem I had with ECW, the problem I had with WC, the problem I had with every W that's ever tried to do this shoot bullshit is because by obvious inference and natural logical progression, if you are telling me that now we are deviating from the norm by really shooting, then that means that everything else is fucking phony as a football bat and you've painted yourself in that corner. You can be edgy and and be more real without coming out and saying that everything else is bullshit. And that's the problem I have. But they're not creative enough to do that because not a lot of people are smart as me. I'm sorry. Well, we have time for one or two more questions here this week, Jim. Let's see. Well, I'm... that's that's very disheartening. Let's see if we can fit them <laughs> on the show with this giant intellect of yours. This next question, Jim, was emailed into corny drive through at gmail.com from Bobby Lamar Say. 
Well, what do what do Bobby Lamar say? I think that's how you'd pronounce it. S E A Y. Say. Go say. ahead. And say, 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 Jim. Say. When I was a kid, I was a fan of the Italian stallion. Well, you were the only one. Was he ever more than a job guy in any territory? And do you have any stories? Oh my God, Stal was Gary Sabal. The Italian stallion, the man with the world's largest head. His head was preternaturally big. It was the size of a fucking multi-gallon bucket or a giant prize-winning melon at the county fair. Um, Stallion was a a good amateur in school. He was legitimately a good amateur wrestler, and he was one of the guys I believe Gene Anderson trained. You know, Gene had broken in the guys that were a step above the TV, you know, Atlanta TV guys that, you know, maybe Mike Jackson used to throw in a car with him and, and, and Nelson Royal had had a hand in it. And, you know, I'm not going to mention all those guys names because then I'll leave somebody out. Well, hell, you know, the Colt Steels and the, the Mitch Snows and the, the David Isleys and the, you know, all of that, those guys that George South that actually knew what they were doing and could work. A lot of those guys were trained by Gene and Nellie. And Stallion made it farther than most, and he was used regularly in it in on Georgia TV and in and on the cards and in the Carolinas quite a bit. Um, but he just he was a heaviest human being. You tried to slam that motherfucker. He was a heaviest human being, and his head was just enormous. And we used to rib him about it. And and he he used to be like a Jimmy Valiant did not drive. We would we would go to Rock Hill, South Carolina, from Charlotte, which was like. 18 miles and it, it was like literally across the state line at the college and we would see jimmy valiant's station wagon at the convenience store five miles from his house where style had picked him up to drive him the other 12 miles or whatever uh but stallion was a good driver and and you know was a good wrestler and had a huge fucking head <laughs> And I don't mean egotistically. I mean, it was just goddamn enormous. Uh, and he was a fun guy. But yeah, that, you know, that was probably his most, when, when TBS took over and the Carolinas was gone and et cetera, that was probably his most shining moment at that point was over with. Sorry to say he was always a channel changer for me, but I, I don't know why, you know, I haven't seen him in years or heard about him in years. I don't know where he is. I don't know why he hasn't come to many of these reunions, if any. I can't remember the last time I saw Stallion. Maybe he's having issues fitting his head through the door. <laughs> yes, it's, it's almost impossible to get that <laughs> fucking giant head all the way in the fucking car. All right, here we go. Uh, here we go. Next question. This one was sent in on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through from Joseph Scharf. <laughs> excuse me, Joseph You're just Schaff. making these fucking No, this is the now. real name. Joseph Schaff, excuse me, there's no R. Scharf or Schaff? Schaff. Schaff? Is Schaff. Oh, you're talking about Schaff. That Schaff, he's a bad mother. We talked about the testes, now we'll talk about the Schaff. Jim, <laughs> been watching a bunch of old wrestling lately. Got a question for Jim Cornette. With no change in presentation, Bobby Eaton went from being introduced as being from Alabama to being introduced as being from parts unknown. What was the deal behind this? I have no idea. I don't know. because That has to be after, because the Midnight Express was never introduced as from Huntsville, Alabama either, so it has to be after Stan and I left, and they were introducing Bobby from his legitimate hometown of Huntsville, Alabama, and then I would have to think that being that it was Bobby and it, it was TBS that maybe somebody was ribbing him and wrote down parts unknown on some fucking announce sheet, and the announcer just said it, because there I don't know anything that was ever done in Bobby's career that would make him come from parts unknown. So it was just more quality control of early 90s TBS. When did you introduce from the dark side? Um, th- I just actually, it, when we went to Dallas, because the first night we were in Dallas, world-class wrestling, I got one of the programs, as was my custom, and it was uh, the Midnight Express. We were from New York City. I'm like, how the fuck did this come about? Because <laughs> we had just come over from from uh, Louisiana, right? From Mid South Wrestling, we were starting in world class, and in the programs, is Dennis Condry, Bobby Eaton from New York City with manager Jim Cornette. I said, "Where the fuck are you getting it?" Well, we just wanted to, basically, in Dallas, they wanted to make us from some place that people go, "Well, fuck those guys." So they put down New York City, 
And I said, if we need, because the, the hometown had not been listed in the Mid South wrestling programs, right? So this had not come up. So I said, if you're going to put a fucking hometown in for us, don't put in New York City because we're actually insulted by that also. Because I wondered why our first night in at TV in Fort Worth at the Will Rogers building or whatever, the people were going, fuck you, you fucking Yankees. I'm like, what the, where the fuck they think we're from? <laughs> so then I saw that and I came up with the, the, from the dark side, the Midnight Express, because there was a hit song on the radio at just about this era of time, which you may recall by John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown band on the dark side. Yeah. And actually tales from the dark side used a line out of that song on the dark side. You know, so people, it just, it, it came to my mind on the sperm of the moment. And then that's when they started putting the program there. Boy, that was fucking thrilling, wasn't it? So Bobby Eaton went from the dark side to Huntsville to Parts Unknown. Well, actually, and, and by way of New York City. By way of New York City. That's yeah, right. <laughs> so we just been long there. All right, well, one final question here this week, Jim. Are you sure? I, <laughs> I hope. Wait, wait <laughs> Well, we'll see how you're screaming we, after this one. We were talking about how these numbers on this program have just been shooting up and up and up, but we've taken care of that today. My feet hurt. Did I mention that? Go ahead. What's your weather. last one? This last question was sent in on Twitter using a hashtag corny drive through from Matt Quick. Why did Jim seem to pair off with Brother Love and just stay in one corner for the entire gimmick battle royal at WrestleMania 17? Because that was the, actually, that was the rib is I, the way I'd gotten into thing, he had mentioned it to me on the phone. We were talking about developmental program business. And I said, well, you ought to just put me in there and I, we'd go off in the corner and fucking not hurt each other with all those other guys throwing taters or whatever. He said, you want to be in it? I said, okay. I said, it's a payoff, right? He said, yeah, it's WrestleMania. I said, okay, I'll be in it. So that's how I got to book to wrestle at WrestleMania. But then when we did go off in the fucking corner, First thing I did was I hit him a fucking, I think a gut shot with the racket and he bent over and head butted me in the fucking mouth. And then <laughs> somewhat one of us, I think he stepped on my foot or I stepped on his foot. And, and <laughs> so we potatoed each other over there in the corner and then, you know, we're dumped to our graceful exits. And that was, you know, that was pretty much that. It was, we just stood over there and potatoed each other back and forth because we were klutzier than we thought the rest of the other guys were. And then I, I, I think what it was Hillbilly Jim that dumped me. He, he, he's, I said, just, I'll go, Jim. He said, don't worry, baby. <laughs> don't worry, baby. You know, Hillbilly. Just, don't worry, baby. <laughs> I got you. You're going to go over just like a feather. And I did. And then boom, and then off we went. And the, and the, the Sheik won because he, he couldn't even take the feather bump over the top rope. So he was he was the only one they couldn't throw over the top so that he had to he had to win it. Any other memories of the gimmick battle royal that you want to share this week before <laughs> <laughs> I had to try to make it entertaining on the way out? <laughs> uh no actually because it was what it was. It was a gimmick battle royal and and it was there was Falderall and shenanigans going on, but it was nice seeing everybody there for a little while and I got, you know, it wasn't a giant WrestleMania payoff. I think we got, it was, was it three grand or was it five grand or whatever we fucking got? But Did you get royalties from that match? From the um, Actually, yes. From the, you know, until they fucking sabotaged everybody on royalties, put up the network, and now nobody gets fucking royalties on DVDs because they don't sell any DVDs. Uh, but yes, for, for quite some time I did. All right. Well, with that, the with drive-thru that. has closed. We... We promise, we promise to do better next week and bring a smile to you people's faces. <laughs> and if we don't, guess what? That's one of the few things you cannot call Stephen P. New for. That's right. You cannot sue through Stephen P. New because we have been shitty to you on our program and, and not entertaining. And what is his phone number once again, Jim? Well, if you really, <laughs> you really must know, it's, it's 888-692-8084, newlawoffice.com, or tinyurl.com slash corny in Chicago, or order from jimcornette.com because I'll be back to work tomorrow when my foot doesn't hurt anymore. tinyurl.com 
slash official corny YouTube to see videos of the drive through and the experience. To <laughs> see back when this show was good and entertaining. And Travis Heckle artwork. Or just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. Hey, hear me on the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership, at 605pod.com or available hey, wherever it is that maybe, you find your favorite podcast. Maybe I don't want to hear you on the fucking Mothership. What hey. about the Mothership? Why didn't Dad get a ship? That's a good question. Well, come up with an answer and get back with me next week. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens next week here on the show. For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! The storms are coming in. I can, I can hear them. <laughs> <laughs>